together because I'm thinking about what this region has for ways that we can solve problems together, um, what kind of shared experiences we have for that unified messaging around prescribed fire, but also around other topics as well. So really thinking about um, what resources are out there for information and collaboration. <coughs> Okay, so um, I'm, I said this is kind of a long presentation, and I've got, um, it's a little bit of a complex topic, and so I, I had this outline here to kind of give you a guide of where, where I'm going to go with this. I'm going to talk a little bit about our challenges, um, and then dive into the solutions. And by solutions, I'm focusing most of this presentation on the collaborations that exist within this region to help us deal with with the problems that we have. And this is where we get into the prescribed fire messaging, uh, thinking about what resources are out there and how we get at that, that point of communication. So this is just one example of challenges. Um, we work with the Association for Natural Resources, Natural Resources Extension Professionals, um, in June, it was on a national basis, and we asked the question in a focus group, what are your challenges for implementing prescribed fire programming? And again, this is, this is uh, corporate extension, so it's technical service providers. But if you look up there at some of those challenges, we hear the exact same ones from groups of managers. We hear the same ones from groups of scientists. So program funding, yeah, we've heard that one before. Finding, sorting, organizing the information making them regionally applicable, that's really big in the East, especially the Northeast. There's tons of stuff going on in our country about fire. What's applicable to us? What about the scale to which we're applying these tools? Um, something we're going to talk a lot about today is this public perception, social, political pressures. We hear a lot that we're reactive in programming and not proactive. Corporate extension had that same, same issue. Uh, getting the landowners to show up so you can actually communicate with them and then of course capacity. So this one I think is really hard to read, but I like this I like this chart. We did some listening sessions with researchers and managers in Massachusetts and New Jersey and what came out of that. Similar political, social, cultural constraints, regional applicability, um, capacity, ecological considerations, and then my favorite one, which is where the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange kind of bases our, our, our work is harmonizing goals, and that is try to meet everybody's needs. That's my, that's my favorite one. I, I, I think that came out of those listening, a listening session, session that we had in New Jersey a couple of years ago. So already we're on the solutions. I didn't want to spend too long on challenges. Uh, you all know the challenges. They're, they're somewhat common. What are our what are our solutions? How do we how do we meet these needs? So one of the solutions that we always hear is communication, and this, this is the basis of this whole workshop, this whole meeting. Communication is key. We know that. And the point that I wanted to try to make is that there needs to be communication all along the way to reach that endpoint. So a lot of times we think about prescribed fire messaging. Some of the agency reports earlier were about tie-ins, landowners, the field visits, all of that when you're actually implementing a burn. But think about it too in your own education and knowledge if you're communicating with those around you like in a meeting like this in some of the um, fire learning network meetings. There's this need for gaining a situational awareness of who all is doing the work and who the stakeholders are. That happens really early on. And that gives you a sense of what the community structure is that you're working with it. And then that also builds the support for the funding and the capacity. Okay, so you need the communication once we're there, once we're implementing, but what I'm going to focus a little bit more on is that communication tool to actually get us to that point. So where are the opportunities? This is probably one of my most boring slides. No pictures, nothing. You have to focus on the text, I guess. Um, I have a couple boring slides in here. So 
So the opportunity here, this was again from that corporate extension meeting in Burlington about a year ago. These are some, some, some themes that emerged from that. Where are the opportunities for the solution? Well, a partnership needs to be useful to all partners, not just one-sided. We really need to think about the gaps in the knowledge. We need a clearing house for information. We need go-to resources. We need hubs where things sit. When we do science delivery, it needs to be targeted toward the audience, and then there needs to be a link for all these various organizations. And some of what I'm going to talk about this morning is getting at these opportunities. These organizations are who's trying to do this. They're trying to build those partnerships. They're trying to build that link to the communication. I'm going to talk about the, fire, the Joint Fire Sciences Program and the uh, Fire Science Exchange ne Network that you've heard about quite a few times. These guys over here, um, the prescribed fire, or excuse me, the fire burning network. Also, prescribed fire councils. You guys know more about that than I do. And the um, Wildland Fire Cohesive Strategy, which I'm sure all of you have heard about. We have various. Um, I, I, I'm going to guess you have a very varying amount of knowledge about what they're working on and what they're doing. I'm also going to talk about something called e-extension, and they have handy a practice for wildfire and prescribed fire, and they're a really cool resource. And when I dive into e-extension, that's when I'm going to talk a little bit about resources and about that prescribed fire messaging. Okay, before that, I'm really just talking about the collaborations that exist to help get this information out there. All right, so Fire Science Exchange Network. Um, this is a network that comes out of the Joint Fire Sciences Program. And Joint Fire Sciences works on effectiveness of federal wildland fire management by providing scientific information tools. When you see JFSP, you think fire science. All those, all those um, little logos down there, that's who's working with JFSP. So DOI and uh, Forest Service, and they're based out of, this group's based out of Boise, they've been established, uh, they were established in 1998, so they've been going for a little while now. valuable 
powerful, credible, relevant hub for fire science information, delivery, collaboration between managers and researchers so that we can create a safe and resilient North Atlantic landscape. <coughs> We, we want to catalyze collaboration. We want to synthesize information and research and make it applicable to you and to your issues and to this region. We look to communicate and facilitate flows of information. You can see that those words again. And we like to think about how to reach joint solutions, an innovative solution. Uh, we do this through field trips and workshops. That's what Amanda does. She and she does a lot of it. So when you get these newsletters, you might be overwhelmed by how much is going on. Uh, it's pretty exciting. We have webinars. We have research briefs to take the, those, those hefty scientific papers and bring them to um, kind of what are the key points, what are your take home messages, and how does it matters to management on the ground. We do a lot of work on those, and we have some examples right there in that little paper folder. <laughs> I don't know the technical term for that. <laughs> uh, and check them out. You might, you might be interested in some of those research briefs, and if you have any ideas for papers that you want us to brief, we'd love to hear it. We have newsletters, which you'll all be getting in your, your mailboxes after this meeting. Uh, we use social media, we use a website. So there's an example of our newsletter. That's where you can get information about events that are happening. Um, I want to point out the website for a minute. There's a new aspect of this website that's coming online where we are trying to bring together all the ongoing research and uh, gray literature that's out there on wildfire and science. There's a graduate student that's doing this for us. And so if you have any um, anything that you think that might be good for that um, database, we'd love to hear about it. Come see me or Amanda, and we'll get you hooked into that. It, you know, it's a, it's a way, to, it's that, it's that go-to research, that, that idea of um, being a clearinghouse of information where you can go and find out what students are working on. We also have a graduate student group. If there's any graduate students that you either know or that are in the room now that are working on fire in our region, we would love to have you join our group. It's kind of a virtual lab as if we were um, working together in, in a lab, in a research lab, but we do it, do it from afar so that we all work together and support each other Okay, here's just an example of some upcoming events. I think um, Ben and Todd mentioned a couple of these. Uh, you know, this, this is, this, here we are right now, February 7th, on the Burning Issues uh, meeting. We also have Keeping the Pine and the Pine Barrens on Long Island, May 3rd and 4th. A Fire and Fuel Monitoring Workshop in Albany Pine Bush in June. And you'll hear, hear from Neil Gifford later. That might get you excited to attend that workshop. And then the big one that I really hope to see you all at is Igniting Exchange. It's a meeting in Maine, uh, a big, big deal conference uh, for both science and management. We're doing this in conjunction with the Northeast Forest Fire Protection Compact. And this is January 2018. Plenty of time to plan. Be there. That'll be big. So that's, um, that's North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the consortium of Appalachian Fire Scientists and Managers, Managers and Scientists. Um, again, their mission is focused on that flow of information about fire science and research needs among managers and scientists in the Appalachian region. So for each of these, remember I mentioned Joint Fire Sciences Program? For each of these fire science networks, we think in terms of what are our region's research needs and try to bring those up to the national level to show their importance. And this is, these are some that the, um, the council came up with, with for, for what are the regional needs in that region area. So out of this idea for research needs came a synthesis fire history of the Appalachian region. And this is a 
a picture of the publication that is going to come out in the next couple of weeks. Yes, so I'm getting some nods from my cast and folks. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and be on the lookout for this. This is the electronic version will come out first, followed by a print version. And this was funded through through the fire exchange. Sam, I think, mentioned the Eastern Oaks Forest Conference. So to to remind you again, it's um, here it is, hosted hosted in Pennsylvania in the fall of 2018. So we're getting your 2018. Does anybody have the 2018 calendars? Are you marking it up? I hope so. Maybe with the electronic versions, you guys can can write those in. Also in fall of 2018 is a training opportunity. Um, <coughs> location is yet to be determined. It might be a little south of here. Um, and, and working with the Fire and Marine Network in the Southern Blue Ridge. Um, and this is this is a track opportunity with the Nature Conservancy. So how to re reach Kathleen? There's some information here. You can see Jen and Todd. Um, they've got a Twitter account. They're on Facebook. And they have a website as well. So those are the two fire exchange organizations in your region. And I, I would also encourage you to look on the Joint Fire Crimes website for other what other exchanges are doing across the country as well. Because we're all doing different different things and we all support each other, but there's there's some great information coming out of the West as well. Okay. Uh, fire Learning Network, this is another one of those collaboratives that's working working on um, together to, to have be a joint project on um, communicating about fire in, in, in our regional scale. And so this one's the Nature Conservancy, the Forest Service, DOI. And the Fire Learning Networks work in terms of landscape and they work with stakeholders. That's a, that's a little bit of a, a difference from from before, they're really more on the ground in particular landscapes, um, thinking in terms of engaging everybody who's involved. Um, they, they think about regulations and funding for ecological fire, uh, restoration of fire adapted ecosystems, and they also have demonstration sites. So we have kind of one main one in this region, which is the um, it's called the Central Central Appalachian <coughs> Fire Central Appalachian Fire Learning Network, and there's also the Southern Blue Ridge. And Jen Bunty knows a lot about that. She's going to talk tomorrow, so she's the Fire Learning Network. <laughs> she's she's going to be talking about Fire Learning Network. Um, but I I just want to point out that there is one of these in this region, and it's important to be involved with them as well when you're thinking about um, about prescribed fire issues. Okay, the next one you guys already know all about, which is the Prescribed Fire Council. And the coalition of prescribed fire councils have this mission, which is to create one voice to assist fire practitioners, policy makers, regulators, and citizens with issues surrounding prescribed fire use. Now, there's a network of prescribed fire councils uh, across the country. And I think that there's, and there's, and there's also a few others that are um, budding, just about to come on board, have been trying to get together throughout the Northeast uh, and neighboring states to you guys, and they look to you for guidance. They're looking to you as role models. Uh, so I will also say that the, probably the other strongest one in our region is New Hampshire, the New Hampshire Prescribed Fire Council. They have a website if you go on the Coalition of Prescribed Fire Council. So maybe good folks to talk to as well. So since you guys already have a good sense of what the Prescribed Fire Councils are doing, um, I'm going to move on to the next one, the next collaborative, which is the Cohesive Strategy in the Northeast U.S. How many people have heard the words Cohesive Strategy? Can you just do a show of hands? Okay, okay, yeah. Well, they've been around for a little while now. Um, national, national effort. The, they are um, set up to evaluate wildfire risk across the country and identify regional priorities. Sounds a little similar to, to what we were saying with JFST, but this is more of um, more management focused and 
um, which they want to make sure are supported by science. So this is this is what we're going to focus on: restoring and maintaining resilient landscapes, safe and effective wildland fire response, and fire adapted communities, and then making sure that science is placed in the middle. There are um, again, it covers the country, but there's just the three regional cohesive strategies: northeast, west, and southeast. There's a wildland fire leadership council that <laughs> governs these through the national strategy committee. A lot of government stuff there. Um, so this regional strategy, re regional cohesive strategy group, is they intend to exchange information and advice related to strategic management and implementation. That's really that's really where their, their focus is, on strategy for management. And they're focusing in on what the land management programs are doing to meet those needs. Uh, they include a lot of organizations, which are listed here. Uh, big ones are federal and state fire organizations. Some of the things that the, the Northeast Regional Cohesive Strategy is working on is improving land fire data, communicating and coordinating among partners, sponsoring workshops, webinars, information sharing, they have monthly newsletters, they have a website, sounds, sounds familiar, a lot of newsletters and websites to get a site on to. Uh, thinking in terms of they're working with the New Hampshire Prescribed Burns Council on fostering new approaches to getting more prescribed fire done. And they're actually working right now on developing a Northeast Community Wildfire Preparation Guide in relation to community wildfire, plant, writing community wildfire preparation plans. Uh, and they like to share successes of collaborative efforts. So, so again, um, all based in restoring landscapes, reducing wildfire risk, and maintaining the wildfire response capability and capacity. Wisconsin. I was just looking at that. Like, that can't be us. Close though. The Northeast Cohesive Strategy, of course, will just relate to. This is a Pennsylvania um, picture, so I made sure to keep this one in here. Is Phil in the room? <laughs> All right. There he is. That's great. Uh, you, you made a national presentation here. Um, so this was a success that the Cohesive Strategy folks asked me to highlight, which was a prescribed fire that was conducted in the in U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center. And they had over 20 firefighters who just came from all different places, including Pennsylvania Bureau, Bureau of Forestry, for this, um, this, this, this burn. And they really felt like that was a success to have so many different people involved and to be restoring landscapes collaboratively. Um, this is another example of what the <coughs> strategy does in sharing success. This is a um, a wildfire in Minnesota in May 2012, where all these agencies came together to work as part of the initial attack of, of these fires. And that was a big deal for, um, as you know, throughout history, we've had, we've had some trouble coordinating on wildfires. We really have, especially when it's mixed agencies. There's, if you study the some of the famous fatality incidents, that's one of the main themes that comes up. And so cohesive strategy is really working on, on improving that coordination and highlighting it, the success when it happens. Uh, so they have their own website, Wildfire in the Northeast or any.blogspot.com that you can check out. You can sign up for the newsletters. The regional reports, and you can can uh, follow their Facebook postings as well if you go to that site. Okay, I told you this is the long presentation. I'm a little more than halfway through now. Um, I'm going to start diving into. So I talked about the Fire Science Exchange Network and the Regional Cohesive Strategy. Um, I want to talk about the community of practice. The East Extension Communities of 
practice. But in talking about that, there, that's when I'm going to dive into those resources and um, those resources for communication. So there's a lot happening with how people are thinking about fire in our region and how people are thinking about communicating it. The extension is based out of our land grant cooperative extension system, and it's a network to help technical service providers come together on certain topics. So there are two communities of practice related to fire. There's a wildfire one and a prescribed fire one. I'm focusing a little more on the prescribed fire one. Their goal is to provide a clearinghouse for information on conducting controlled burns and the effects of fire on plants and wildlife. They provide information through articles and frequently asked questions. They have this really cool um, feature here on Ask, Ask an Expert. So you can get involved through this either being an expert yourself or asking the questions. And you can also sign up for fire news and events through, through these sites. So North Carolina State has done a good bit of work here, so some of the information is a little to the south of us. This is just a laundry list of examples of communicate resources that they list on their site related to communication. And these are these are booklets, pamphlets, research studies, presentations. You click on them, can explore what interests you. Again, this particular list is communication re resources. Um, the one down at the bottom there is tools for engaging landowners and farmers. Another list they have is organized by resource type and the online resources that relate to what you need. So if you're looking at engaging youth particularly, you can go over and, and find out more about Sparky the Fire Dog, about fireworks, Smokey the Bear, Living with Fire. There's all those resources listed out. There's professional development programs and wildland urban interface is another example. So the list of communication resources is pretty extensive, extensive there. And it's, it's, a lot of the work has come from North Carolina State University and the work that Jennifer Evans has done with this community of practice. And I will say that she was the first choice for giving this presentation today. And I think she's either in Spain or just coming back from Spain. So she recommended me, got stuck with me instead. Uh, but she has done a lot of work on prescribed fire messaging and I wanted to bring some of her work to you today anyway. And she was communicating with me last week while she was in Spain to make sure that you got some of this information. Um, there she is right there. And she works with a graduate student, John Diaz at North Carolina State as well. So she did a survey um, to think to, to, to try to get at the, what are the barriers and recommendations for effective communication, what are the needs, and then she also added in some questions about social media use and evaluation use. And all of this is, you can <coughs> link to, to this, I'm just going to present some highlights. This particular survey was in 13 southern states. Not a lot of surveys sent out, but boy, really high response rate, 84%. Not sure how she did that. That's pretty impressive. Um, and, and also a great variety of audience, of the audience. Landowners, consultants, agency folks, academia. And this is, this is some of the work that came out of it that I found really interesting. Here are words, phrases, and messages that really resonated with the survey participants. They liked the term good fire. Good fires prevent bad fire. They liked talking in terms of safety and applying a process to ensure forest health to reduce wildfire. Defense. This is one of my favorites. Using the term flammable plant and vegetation rather than fuel. Talking about economics. So opening up that line of communication is thinking about what gets the stakeholders. I'm sure you've all heard this one before, but this is this also came out of this survey in the South. Controlled works prescribed is a little confusing to the to some 
Info. Wildlife habitat, everybody's favorite. So it's very effective in conveying the role of the tribe fire to the public. Here's another one that's talking about the language of fire. And this is from the Partners in Fire Education Group. I like this because it just lays it out. It's very clear. Use the words natural areas instead of wildland. Wildland. I have a degree in wildland ecology. Nobody can get it right. My mother always says wildlife. And I don't know anything about hers. So wildland, ecosystem, landscape, those, those, those meanings are hard to grasp. But natural area makes sense. And that's something that a lot of people can, can relate to. Home here, natural areas. What's wild and urban area? Fire teams. Cutting and removing overgrown brush and trees rather than mechanical thinning. What's mechanical thinning mean? Managing natural fires where it's safe. Safe, that word safe again. So what works? What's most successful? This is again from the survey results that Jennifer did. Well, now we come back to my, we're coming full circle. It has to be cooperative. It has to be collaborative. A mix of hands-on, written, and visual. You know that in any kind of education uh, opportunity, there's a mix because we all think of things differently. We all learn differently. Think of your role ahead of time uh, before you launch into the communication effort. Always, always think in terms of hybrid of information, of giving information, classroom versus field setting. Be very targeted when you speak to your audience. And field trips, field trips, field trips, workshops, live demonstration. So I am actually wrapping, wrapping up the, the talk a little early, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about this idea of live demonstration. And then, and then I'll turn it back over to the, to the group here. Um, one of the concepts that we think about in science delivery is how can we bring people to the field as if they were there? As if, because, or we'll bring them to the field anyway, but, but you, you have the limitations of travel, you have the limitations of, of um, funding of time. Who has time to go spend every day in the field looking at all these sites? And so one of the ways that we're thinking about this is in terms of, um, of improving this, this demonstration site concept is to bring people there without actually going there. And so you can actually visit a site from your computer, from your ever increasing use of these things, um, tablets, iPhones. And we're using, uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're using 360 degree photography and video, going out to the site, <coughs> capturing these images, piling on resources into these images and into these and editing these videos down so that you get the clear, concise message from the people who are the most important and critical in, in this delivery process. And you put it all together and you bring people to the site in a, in a, in a virtual experience. Okay? And, and there's some folks working on this for fire in the South. I happen to be doing a project on it for climate adaptation. This particular picture, I think, is Providence Water up in Rhode Island. It's a 360 picture, and I don't, I don't actually have the live. I can try it, but I don't think I have the live connection here. So, um, so, so come see me, and I can show you. I can show you what we're doing. Where you can, there's a couple of different ways you can do it, but you can hold up your phone and, and look around, and you see the fire burning. You're there. Well, what a great tool for bringing stakeholders to the scene when you can't actually get them to show up. So that's, uh, that's an example of a way to, to organize virtual demonstration.